that you accomplish something. Well, what I, you do I in most of these cases is to, f is to have people waste, in order to get around you now, as they undoubtedly get around you, they waste some of what you give them. Now, when I, I grant, but you see, my, my moral premise is one that I know you're very sympathetic with, namely that, um, uh, and this is a stra strange for such a precisionist as you, when you talk about people being entitled to something, it is impossible to say that anybody is entitled to a negative income tax without saying that other people have a corresponding duty to make that available to if them. If I said that people were entitled to a negative income tax, I'm sorry, I didn't intend to say that. Oh, that was quote unquote. Well, that they uh, should I, 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 <coughs> all I have said is that. We, those of us who are paying taxes, mm -hmm. have decided that we want to pay some taxes in order to provide assistance yeah. to the disadvantaged. Yeah. Now, it's perfectly appropriate for us to make that decision, but having made that decision, I would like to see us do it in a way which helps them as much as possible. I, I, on, the, on the contrary, I agree that as a moral principle, those of us who pay to provide subsidies for others have every moral right to say what it shall be used for. Mm -hmm. If we want to say we will give you money only if you use it to buy toothpaste and not for anything else, mm -hmm. that's our right. But I think we are very unwise to exercise it. I think we would be wiser and more truly charitable and do both them and ourselves more good. Tell them to use it to buy a national review. Tell them to use it to buy, <laughs> <laughs> to tell them to use it to buy what they will. Yeah. Beer, pushpin, whatever. Because in doing so, we not only give them more help immediately, but we give them an opportunity to develop their own sense of responsibility. You know, I'm sure, we all do when we try to raise our children. Uh, we often see our children do something that we think is wrong, but we feel they must make their own mistakes because that's the only way they're going to learn to be responsible individuals. Yes, In the same uh, yeah, way I right. feel this about... Assuming you can program a normal evolution, but I think that one of the, one of the crises of the urban situation is that we are face to face with a sociological datum that we haven't coped with uh, through traditional experience. Uh, That's true. The question is, how do we how do we reverse the process? Yeah, how exactly. do we get how do we out? Break the cycle? How do we get away from where we are now? Yeah. And nobody that I know of has proposed any alternative to the negative income tax as a way in which you can get out of your present mess in a gradual way. Without doing, in, uh, without greatly hurting the people you're trying to help. Uh, There's Dr. a question. Yeah. I was wondering if the negative income tax and the Council for Volunteer Military and other right-wing libertarian proposals, if these wouldn't have a useful Trojan horse effect, insofar as they're attractive to liberals and other leftists, who unwittingly, therefore, would be supporting programs that lay the basis for further economic liberty. Well. That's a complicated and difficult question. Uh, I think that one of the uh, encouraging things is that so many of the people who have been in favor of welfare state activities and of increasing governmental intervention have been becoming disillusioned with it. And I do think it is desirable uh, for those of us who share their ultimate objectives but who believe that they are following the wrong means, I think it's desirable for us to go along and try to develop programs which they can support. Now, this is, in a sense, a Trojan horse approach, and I have no objection to its being a Trojan horse approach. See, the thing that fascinates me is that as I talk with the people who regard themselves as welfare staters or liberals, I don't find the difference between them and myself to be very much in our objectives. We both want to achieve the same ends. The difference is in what means we think are appropriate to those objectives. Both they and I want to help the people who are relatively poor insofar as we can. We would like to have a world in which everybody has an opportunity to develop his own capacities. They think that enacting a minimum wage will help people. I think that enacting a minimum wage will hurt people. Well, in this respect, I quite agree that as they're becoming disillusioned with our present welfare arrangements, and if we can get them to support a negative income tax, maybe, as they see how well a much freer and more libertarian approach works, maybe they will be induced to apply the same reasoning to the next problem. W would you insist uh, that um, you would not endorse the negative income tax uh, uh, unless it were agreed that uh, a, whole lot, a whole lot of other existing programs be repealed as part of the same uh, well, reform? The problem is a whole lot. I think at the moment that uh, 
Well, I would be definitely opposed to a negative income tax, which was simply piled on top of yeah. our present welfare program. Mm -hmm. But I think... Would you consider farm subsidies part of that welfare no, program? No, no. This right. is what I was saying. That is, I think that the thing where you have the greatest hope and need for a substitution is that the negative income tax could replace direct relief and aid to dependent children. Mm -hmm. Those two programs are money. intimately... Consumer, right. Yeah. And moreover, you see, the point is this. If you just added it on, but kept all of... We'll be back in a moment with more discussion by Mr. Buckley and his guest, Bilton Friedman. I agree. I think I would be opposed to it except as a substitute for welfare and direct relief programs. Now, as a long-run matter, I would hope that as we saw that this solved that problem, we could eliminate a lot of the other bad programs that we have, such as minimum wages, mm -hmm. such as agricultural <coughs> subsidies, such as urban renewal, such as public housing, and so on, all of which are programs intended to help the poor, but which hurt the poor. And I think that if we could really handle the problem of poverty by this one general measure, maybe we could get rid of some of these others. W would you, would you uh, be in favor of eliminating the franchise, the vote, for people who are beneficiaries who fall in the negative level? No, not at all. Uh, there was a day when that might have been possible. But you know, as I once said when I was asked this question, in the modern day and age, it isn't only the poor who feed at the public trough. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to eliminate the franchise, for the poor who are helped by the negative income tax, then you must eliminate the franchise for the people in the oil industry who are helped by percentage depletion, for the people in the steel industry who are helped by tariffs, for the people in the radio industry who are helped by exclusive franchises for stations, and so on down the list. And therefore, I think there is no case in the modern day for making this particular invidious distinction. Well, isn't, uh, in, in the first place, that's not necessarily a bad idea, but uh, in the second... <laughs> in, 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 who, in the modern day and age, who would vote? Yeah. Uh, here, neither you nor I. I could not vote because I am uh, employed at a university which receives a large part of its funds from the federal government. For all I know, some of my salary comes from that way. You could not, surely, you clearly could not vote because the National Review benefits from the postal subsidy. Your mailing... <laughs> No, we Under don't. We, we law. don't go out by first-class mail. No, no, <laughs> but that's all the worse. Under yeah, first-class right. mail, first-class mail more than pays its way. It's first-class mail that's paying your subsidy. Yeah. The subsidy is for third and fourth-class mail, which is being distributed at a cost considerable, uh, at a price considerably below its cost. Yeah, well, I think this is a reductive ad absurdum, actually, isn't it? Because, uh, for instance, when John Stuart Mill recommended removing the franchise for people, who, as he put it. Uh, uh, were uh, 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 beneficiaries of the parish. Uh, he was living in an age uh, where uh, uh, such observations as you just finished making also obtained. Very little. And so on, so very little. Okay. No, no, not at all. In John Stuart Mill's day, Britain had gone to complete free trade. There were no tariffs. In John Stuart Mill's day, I would have been in fa I might well. I don't know whether I would have been. Mm -hmm. I can conceive of my having been in favor of, of the proposal. Because in John Stuart Mill's day, it's hard to see who was benefiting at the public trough except for people on the parish. There were no tariffs. There were no prohibitions on establishing newspapers or businesses or TV stations or other things <laughs> through governmental mm. control. Now, there was a postal subsidy. Yeah. Incidentally, I wonder, Bill, are you, as I am, in favor of uh, eliminating the present provision that uh, prevents anybody from carrying mail for profit? Oh, certainly. certainly. Yeah. Well, now, no, if we eliminated the post office, that, yeah. then maybe you could be yeah, yeah. <laughs> entitled to vote. Yeah. And it may, it may be that the Democratic administration will do it for us. Uh, there's a question uh, over here. Yeah. Dr. Friedman, a few moments ago, you mentioned that you would substitute, you would use the negative income tax as a substitute for present welfare programs. Now, uh, given that, it would seem that a family of four which had, a neg uh, which had no income at all for a given year would receive $1,500 under your program. Now, they would actually be, saving, re, be receiving less under your program than they would under the present system. Not at all. You are making the usual mistake that people who live in New York tend to make of judging the rest of the country by this little parochial area here. <laughs> if, you, if you look over the U.S. as a whole, you will find that that $1,500 exceeds the welfare payments now being received by the gr in, the great, in, the, in the great majority of states in the United States. Now, I want to emphasize that we have a federal system, that the circumstances differ in different states. Just as New York City now in, uh, pays supplementary welfare benefits over and above 
the amounts that are paid in other states. So if you had a national negative income tax on the federal level, which would establish a minimum standard countrywide, there is no reason at all why any state which felt moved to do so, such as New York State, if it's particularly affluent and it wishes to maintain a higher standard of welfare payments, there is no reason why uh, New York State could not have a supplementary negative income tax, just as it now has a supplementary positive income tax. And it would be perfectly easy to work the techniques to tie them together just as they are now tied together. What we're talking about, what I've been talking about, is a federal minimum standard. And if you look at the facts, you will find that the great bulk of the poor all over the country would be better off under the negative income tax arrangements than they are now. Uh, yes. Dr. Friedman, you suggested uh, that your program would have its greatest effect if uh, uh, the bureaucracy of the present welfare system could be, in a way, done away with. And in view of the fact that the present welfare system is, by and large, operated on a state or local level, and your program is federal, I was wondering, how would this be accomplished? Because while it's operated on a state or local level, a large fraction of the funds come from the federal government. And what I would hope would be that if the federal government moved to a negative income tax <coughs> scheme for assisting the poor, the local and states would also move to such a scheme insofar as they supplemented the federal. You know, most of the, mostly, well, this is an interesting question you're raising. Most of the time, it's almost impossible to get rid of an entrenched government program mm -hmm. because <coughs> the bureaucracy has a vested interest and will fight it tooth and nail. The situation is a little bit different in this area. The reason is that being a welfare worker or a social worker under our present programs is such an unattractive job that there's an enormous turnover. And as a result... Mr. Buckley and his guest, Milton Friedman, will have further comment in a moment. There's an enormous... It's, it's very hard to staff these programs because they're such unattractive jobs. The welfare workers object to them, and I don't blame them. They are right. They say, instead of our being able to help these people, we become their enemies. And we spend so much of our time in paperwork and in filling out the forms that we don't have time to do what we really would like to be doing. Well, um, uh, while, while we are reforming uh, uh, the sumptuary laws of the, of the country, what about your proposal to uh, eliminate the progressive feature of the income uh, tax? Uh, am I correct that you calculated a few years ago that if you eliminated uh, uh, all, uh, uh, all deductions, you could have a top rate of 23%, but also a minimum rate of 23%, and raise the same amount of money? Well, the situation now is even more striking, Bill, and it's this. Uh, you see, you don't really have a progressive income tax. If by progressive you mean higher rates on people of higher incomes, there's a, you know, this is a semantic business, and I, I don't like to refer to the income tax as progressive, because that begs the question. It's graduated not progressive. In fact, it's a retrogressive measure uh, in terms of its effect on society and on the freedoms of our citizens. But if you look at the situation now, the graduated rates are a fake. The rates go from 14 percent to 70 percent at the top, but very few people pay the higher rates because the income tax law is so full of loopholes uh, through I mentioned some of them before in percentage depletion, but capital gains provisions, interest on state and local bonds, et cetera. There are so many uh, loopholes that very few people pay it. The effective rate being what, 45 or something like that? No, no, 42? no. Suppose you take the present law, Bill, and you suppose you take rates 14 to 70, mm -hmm. and you do a bit of arithmetic. At those rates, people have reported on their income tax return a certain total amount of income. Mm -hmm. And you can ask yourself the question, what flat rate would give you the same amount of revenue. That's only arithmetic. And you, you were talking about 23%, you said 45%. We might get uh, some, maybe we could get some of these students here to guess at what that number would turn out to be. If the range is 14 to 70, what do you suppose is the average single rate which levied on the amount of ta income now reported would give you the same revenue. Do you happen to know the answer? Yes, of course. You know it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, You, I thought you were aware of the professorial ethics. <laughs> <laughs> no professor asks the question. I know the Socratic manner is not a game at which two people can play. No. <laughs> <laughs> what is the answer? The answer is 19 percent. 19. Now, ni if, in fact, if you substituted 19% for the present 14 to 70% rate, let's suppose you made no change in the law, except you put a flat 19% rate in, all income, yeah. instead of 14 to 70. Mm -hmm. 
but let all the definitions. In fact, you would raise a good deal more money than you do now. The reason for that is it wouldn't pay people to get around the tax so much. Here's a man 